name of this session is Advancing Engagement of Underserved Populations in Pancreatic Diseases. Uh, I, just a, a quick, brief uh, introduction to this. I, you know, I'd like to thank CAPER and Pancreas Fest for continuing the, the, the investigation in this, because I think this is incredibly important. I think our next three speakers will emphasize the importance of why diversity, not only in clinical trials, but also in the study of these diseases is incredibly important, given that it's become such an incredible kind of area of investigation looking at survival. And so differences in ethnicity and race have an impact. Uh, and I think that's going to be the, the future of, of, of the, these works. So thank you all for, for being here. I'm Jose Trevino. I'm from VCU Health, uh, the Division of Surgical Oncology. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and start with our first speaker, uh, Dr. Yaziki from the University of Illinois, Chicago, my hometown. Great, I would like to start by thanking the program chairs and committee for giving me the opportunity to discuss this important topic. So I have no financial disclosures. So first I will review the importance of establishing a diverse cohort for pancreatic, pancreatitis studies. And uh, we'll review um, how we have done in regards to enriching diversity in pancreatitis studies in the past and some of the strategies that we utilize in our clinical center to further increase their diversity. And then I will briefly review if some of the progress we have done uh, in our larger pancreatitis study. So why this topic is important is because minorities are disproportionately affected in, in pancreatic diseases. And as a diverse and inclusive community, we need to represent the entire population in our studies. If you do not have adequate representation of minorities, how we can really um, address the health inequities. And we have heard about some of the biomarkers and tools, and as they are being developed, we want to make sure that they have large scale applicability, as well as we have learned about some of the interventions and drugs during the NIDDK workshop, and we need to make sure that they are accessible and that their use should be feasible by the entire population, including the minority. So that's why it is really an important topic. So, and we know that racial and ethnic minorities um, are at increased risk for developing acute pancreatitis and also pancreatitis related complications. And African Americans in particularly, they are two times more likely to develop pancreatitis. And they also have higher rates of pain and disability due to pancreatitis than any other racial groups. And also there are studies showing that they are less likely to be transferred to tertiary care centers for higher level of care. Hispanics with acute pancreatitis are also shown to have significant delays in receiving care when they present to emergency department. And this problem with minorities um, in regards to care has also uh, been shown in, in indigenous populations in other countries. So it's a global problem. And if you look into um, how we have done in the past in regards to increasing um, representation of minorities. These are some actually important publications and projects that address some of the key topics in pancreatitis, including natural history, um, contribution of alcohol and smoking, um, the development of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency following acute pancreatitis, physical, mental, social health, and some of the fluid studies. But across the board, um, and there are many others to add, it's just I put only a few of them here, but you can see that. Across the board, um, 80 to 85, 80 to 90 percent of the population included here are, are whites, and we are significant. We have significant underrepresentation of minorities in in acute pancreatitis studies over the past two decades. There is only one study um, that I, I included here from Dr. Box, one that has you know significantly higher uh, percentage of Hispanics included in this study, but uh, we do not have any racial representation of minorities here either. So how we are doing um, in regards to that in, in our institution. Um, so UIC is a research one minority serving institution and uh, we serve to a very diverse community. Close to 50% of our patients are African-Americans. Hispanics make approximately 24%, Caucasian 20%, Asian 
Asian or other racial groups make approximately 8% of our study population. And we have completed a case control study in 2021, looking into the role of diet and microbiome in acute pancreatitis. And we were successful in establishing a really diverse cohort that's enriching underrepresented minorities. We have included 100 patients in this, in this study, 54 acute pancreatitis and 46 control patients. And African-Americans and Hispanics in this study made 82% of uh, our acute pancreatitis cohort. And we have been using some strategies to increase their engagement, and I will go over that. But before that, I want to briefly touch on how important the social determinants of health in, in regards to really enriching um, the presence of minorities in our studies, because if you do not really pay attention to this, I don't think that we will be able to increase their representation. We have done uh, great work in regards to identifying acute pancreatitis ideologies, and we have been working on developing better tools to to predict disease severity. So that is an area that we have done well. But if you look into those intermediate and distal factors that are social determinants of health, from physical activity to the diet, to crime rate in the area, to safety, to, to access to healthy foods, um, this has been unfortunately a very understudied area in our field. And because of our interest, uh, we wanted to see if we could do um, uh, and look into our data to see if we can uh, find a quantitative way to really look into that. And that cohort that I briefly mentioned earlier that included 54 acute pancreatitis patients, we look into um, to see if they were more socially vulnerable compared to acute pancreatitis patients, non-Hispanic whites. And even those who have acute pancreatitis, if you look here, we use the CDC social vulnerability index, you will see that minorities, both African-Americans and Hispanics, they're um, grouped together. They, they have significantly higher social vulnerability compared to non-Hispanic whites. And this is really important because not that we only struggle to, to include them in our pancreatitis studies. This tells us up front that probably we are gonna have significant problems also retaining them in our studies because they have so, so much more barriers for participating in research. So we use some uh, strategies which I think really helps us uh, to increase their representation. One of them is to have a diverse and really cultural component study team. And um, it really, I think, plays a key role. Obviously we have consent forms translated in Spanish. You can call the translator online, but when you have a coordinator or study team member that speaks the same language that connects to the patient to that degree, it right there increases the potential of participation in the research study. So this is key. The second key point I think is, is time. You really need to spend time and uh, really connect with that patient. If they see that you really care uh, about their disease process and you are there really to help and support. And if they see that empathy, it really increases their probability of part participation. Um, and also I personally participate in that process unless I'm off campus or have another clinical duty, I really go and see these patients in person, even if they decide not to enroll in our study, because I think that's a really important point to establish a trust with patient. And that really also increases their representation. Another thing is, which is really important, Dr. Donwell, uh, Conwell will, will touch on this, the education. If you are there with the patient, then you can only use that time, that opportunity to really educate the patient. I talk to them about their pancreatitis. If we know the ideology, I explain it to them. I explain them what I predict that how long it will they, it take for them to, to discharge. And, and I always conclude that with, with what I did here, present them in regards to data that um, how low their participation in, in, in pancreatitis studies, that they are disproportionately affected as a community, but we don't know why. And part of the reason, because we cannot have their participation in this study. I think that really empowers the patient. Then they see them themselves as being rather than a research participant in this study that empowers them. It gives them power to go and participate in that study to make a difference for their community. So I think that really plays a key role. And the other thing is flexibility. Even if we did not really discuss the study uh, participation, uh, we always follow up with them either with phone or try to bring them back to clinic. And you really need to be flexible there because 
of all of those um, barriers, structural barriers or social vulnerability that they may not have the flexibility that any other patient has. And local resources, many of large institutions have uh, CCTSs and community engagement and advisory boards. I use that for my first study and I think that has been quite helpful that uh, it's a resource that we can utilize. Um, another thing is support. Uh, we briefly touched on social determinants of health and for your study, it might be a single visit, maybe two visits, and um, but it could be really significantly difficult for these communities because they may not have a, a similar job like you have, that they may, it might really be difficult for them to take time off from their work. Even if they have the, the time off, that they may not have the financial resources to come and visit you. So you really need to support them and have that incorporated in your project in order to increase their participation. So with that, I will move into to another study that we have been doing collaboratively called Type 1 DAPC Consortium and its prospective study, DREAM study. And you can see the clinical centers um, that are included in this uh, nationwide study. And there is a really good geographical um, uh, diversity here, as you can see. And these clinical sites actually have been carefully selected by NIH during the review process to represent that geographical um, uh, diversity, and it includes large academic centers in urban areas that serve underrepresented minorities. And some of our clinical centers predominantly serve African and African American and Hispanic communities, as we do in our um, institution. And once we start to to work as a consortium, uh, we form the recruitment and retention committee right right away at the beginning with the primary goal of uh, enhancing the participant recruitment and maximize retention for the study. But another key goal was, uh, and a task was to ensure that minorities are being included in this study in an equitable way. And we have implemented some strategies as listed, reviewing of the screen logs regularly to evaluate inclusion of minorities. And if there was any limitation there, um, creating potential solutions, um, and alternatives and discussing this um, in the consortium and, and, and implementing if needed to increase uh, their representation. And obviously we wanted to leverage the experience that we had um, some of our clinical centers. And we also, with the support from a recruitment innovation center at Vanderbilt, created a very detailed recruitment and retention plan for this system study. And it focused on four key areas, study awareness, site engagement, participant engagement, and identification and addressing of potential barriers. And so how we have done, uh, we have uh, done actually quite well compared to other studies in the past. At UIC, we still continue to do very well, and more than 90% of our patients that are enrolled into DREAM study are, are from minorities, Hispanics, or African-Americans. And if you look into our own um, entire data set for the consortium, you can see that we have a really good representation of racial minorities, 26%, and ethnic minorities, 16%. That really mimics the, the, the entire US population. But another key important um, uh, rep data here in this slide is not that we are only able to engage them in our study and recruit them. You can see that during our three month follow-up visit, we are able to retain these minority communities. You can see that Again, racial minorities coming back for their visits at 26% and also ethnic minorities showing up for their visits at 14.5%, which is very similar to their uh, retention uh, and um, recruitment rate. So in summary, uh, we need to have policies and priorities set up ahead of time if we really want to reach goal. And if you look into this RFA from NIH uh, for the Taiwan DAPC Consortium, you can see that it was really clearly stated um, in that RFA that this, the goal was to undertake these studies in racially and ethnically diverse uh, population. And you have to have local resources and uh, obviously institutional support is very important and you may have community engagement and advisory boards. We have institution for uh, minor theon and research at our institution. So if you engage them early on, that is probably uh, going to help a lot uh, in regards to their represent, uh, re representation. And having a diverse research team is very important. And our 
Spanish speaking coordinator has been helping us a lot in that regard. You want to make sure you um, really engage these patients early on and you keep them engaged. And um, obviously, uh, our approach to them during hospitalization, even if our goal is to enroll them as our patient, has been helping in that regard. The other key part here is to recognize and address the structure of barriers. It's very important because we had many patients um, that we thought that they would easily make to their clinical appointment because they were living only 20 minutes away. But then follow up visit, we find out that it actually took them for one and a half hours because they do not have car to drive. So they have to go walk to a bus station, take a bus 30 minutes, go take to the train 40 minutes. So they missed their appointment. So we were able to implement a, um, a ride share service for them and that significantly increased their participation. And rapport. I think if you do all of these, probably that's going to have a major impact uh, in maintaining the trust and rapport uh, with your patient. And that is very likely to increase the recruitment and retention. With that, I would like to thank uh, my team at UIC, uh, specifically Heya, who is doing a great job uh, by recruiting and retaining these uh, minority communities. To Evan and Darwin, we have been working very closely in the recruitment and retention committee. And also again to Sage and Darwin, uh, which, which we are working together, especially in, in this in this area. So thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. We'll hold we'll hold questions until the end, and panel discussion. So our next speaker will be Dr. Balagon. Uh, from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and the title of his talk is "Improving Recruitment of Minority Population in Pancreatic Cancer Clinical Trials." Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Folu Balogun, as we just heard. Uh, you'll notice that in my talk, there are a lot of themes that Dr. Yaziki just um, presented that are recurring. And it does speak to the fact that clinical trials as a whole, whether we're looking at pancreatic cancer or pancreatitis, there, there are lots of um, underlying um, similarities. So disparities occur or exist in, in cancer as a whole and in pancreatic cancer too. When you look at racial and ethnic minority populations in the United States, they're worse, they do worse in terms of with uh, cancer outcomes. When you look particularly at Black and African-American populations, you see that their outcomes are overall worse. When you look at African, um, Asian Pacific Islanders and Hispanic, cancer is the leading cause, a leading cause of uh, death in these, in these populations. When we zoom in a little closer to pancreatic cancer, we see that when you compare Black or African-American to non-Hispanic white, they have a 40, over a 40% chance, higher chance of being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and their mortality rate is about 20% higher. We see here that um, in, trying to set this one. Yeah, so we see in the figures up here with the overall survival, five-year overall survival, and we see when we compare black versus non-Hispanic whites, it looks a little less across the different stages. Um, and it, they present also later or with more aggressive disease. Some of these are related to the, a lot of these, a predominant amount of it is the social determinants of health, which is underlie, which underlies, uh, which is for which structural racism underlies it. But uh, while this doesn't look too bad, when you look at the figure, we are doing a little better with pancreatic cancer mortality. But you see that when you look at black men and black women compared to non-Hispanic whites, that their improvement in survival is kind of, not just stopped or plateaued, but is actually getting worse more recently. Now, there are several factors affect, that affect uh, pancreatic cancer incidence and outcomes. Some are modifiable, some are non-modifiable. I put up this list here to highlight that what we'll be talking, what we're talking about, clinical trials, does affect a significant a significant number of these. Now, when you look at clinical trials. Um, Clinical trials are very important. They allow us to better understand diseases, also allow us to uh, get exposure, uh, expose our patients to the more promising and newer drugs. It does is associated with improved survival. When we look at clinical pancreatic cancer clinical trials uh, between 2005 and 2020, uh, this is actually a study for which uh, Dr. Trevino is the senior author. 
Uh, we see that there's a big uh, underrepresentation of uh, racial and ethnic, ethnic minority groups. And we see here that we have about 85% of those who are in clinical trials are non-Hispanic white. And we have just 8% for Black. Asian Pacific Islanders are 2.5% or a little less than that. And with American Indian, we're looking at 0.3%. With Hispanic, is 8.5%. Now, there are reasons why there are barriers to clinical trials. So we've talked about where we mentioned briefly the struct, the social determinants of health. There's also a mistrust of the health system, which I put this up here to highlight uh, when we talk of, say, when we mentioned the Tuskegee um, experiments, just the uh, approach or in the community or how the health system is viewed. This was this study was run up until 1972. So that's 50 years ago. The average age for diagnosis of pancreatic cancer is about 70 years. So people who are being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer now were alive then. Uh, and they were not just alive, they were teenagers or young adults. There's also, um, there are other examples to um, one of which was the uh, sulfalanamide one, which is earlier in the 20th century, where children were given uh, cough syrup that was using an antifreeze, an antifreeze agent to, to dissolve the syrup. So that led to, that has led to stories being told, which were true, where children, you give your children cough syrup and then they die, uh, unfortunately. So these, 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 are, these are true, these are real, and they're still, and they're not just something of the past. They're also things that have been that we still experience today. So we should be mindful of these, uh, this history, the history of clinical trials in the US and when we're trying to approach our patients for clinical trials. Now, some other um, barriers that we deal with are that, and I'll hope to touch on uh, examples of, include the uh, eligibility criteria for clinical trials that are too strict. Um, we can say they're too strict, or we can also say that they're not inclusive enough. So at baseline would have different uh, lab levels, lab, lab values, but a lot of the criteria that determine who is eligible for a trial is born really out of, is born out of a predominant uh, group. So that may not apply to everyone. It does not apply to all groups. Clinical trials tend to be inaccessible because a lot of the major, the location of the major academic trial um, centers that run these trials. So geography is a problem. Resources, as Dr. Yaziki just also mentioned, poor community engagement is another big barrier. And these barriers exist at all levels, both at the level of the scientists, at the level of the participants, and the study level, which is also infrastructural. We should consider these barriers when, des when designing clinical trials. Uh, it's important to engage the community, build that trust. And um, just to mention that engagement is not necessarily the same thing as recruitment. While this title of this trial is about increasing recruitment, engaging the community is more about building a partnership with the community. And that goes beyond just clinical trial recruitment. But when we do engage the community, it improves overall health um, outcomes and also improves our clinical trial recruitment. So some steps, a couple of steps I'll mention just about um, how we can improve clinical trial and recruitment. So design inclusive clinical trials. So in this study that was published uh, just last year, uh, black patients were shown when you looked at, this is when I, this was the example about the inclusivity of the criteria. There are criteria that we that are decide, determine who's eligible or ineligible for a clinical trial, mostly based on lab and personal um, medical history. And looking at black patients, and this was in VCU um, with Dr. Trevino's group, looking at black patients versus non-Hispanic white patients, they saw that the traditional, which is the predominant criteria for lab-based implement in pancreatic cancer trials, actually led to less, resulted in less black patients being eligible. So more black patients were excluded from pancreatic trials based on the um, trials, based on the criteria. Put another way, Beyond the inaccessibility of clinical trials, when the black patients gets to actually gets the academic center to get on the trial, the way we design the trial is such that we're excluding them at a much higher rate than we are our non-Hispanic white counterparts. So they had proposed some criteria, very reasonable criteria that does not sacrifice uh, the health of the patients or the information you glean from the clinical trials that. And 
reran essentially the analysis again. Some of this criteria are listed here. The renal function, rather than using creatinine, use creatinine clearance of greater than 30. For patients that have HIV and hepatitis B, if they're being managed on medications, that should not make them exclu uh, excluded from the trials. Definitely, as we do with other drugs, we checked interactions. Um, just last week, uh, I had a patient that was on uh, fluoxetine in interaction with one of the trials we wanted to get her on, and we just simply changed the medication. So this can happen with patients who are on HIV and hepatitis B uh, medications. Prior malignancy is a typically an exclusion criteria, and understandably so. We also need to glimpse it. We, it's important to actually have clinical trials that generate uh, useful information for us. But when you do consider how uh, the poor prognosis of this disease, pancreatic cancer overall, prior malignancy should not just be a blanket of, if you have a prior malignancy within the last two or five years, you can't be eligible for it, but rather, if it's in remission or if you're not on treatment, it makes sense to still be uh, considered for the clinical trials. Other things like diabetes and cardiac stents, if it's, you can start diabetes on treatment easily and you can actually, if you're asymptomatic with a cardiac stent, shouldn't exclude you. What we see here is using the prior traditional criteria, we see uh, percent excluded from the criteria with blue being the uh, black patients and red being the white patient. So we see with the traditional criteria, we have about 42% versus 33%. But with these proposed criteria, we have a significant decrease in the amount of patients that are excluded from clinical trials. So this not only affects the uh, racial and ethnic minority patients, the black patients in this case, it also helps the non-Hispanic white patients. And without necessarily sacrificing uh, care, in clinical trials. Another thing is to engage, truly engage the community. So community could be defined based on geography, identity, experience, uh, even social experiences. Now, a quick mention, I attended a talk recently and it pointed out the difference between collaboration and participation. So collaboration can be viewed as I, as the PI, come up with a trial and then I get reach out to the community and say, hey, how can we make this work? And that's good. But even better is participation where I reach out to the community and together we come up with the ideas. We come up with the, with the trial. So engage the community or involve the community very early on. We can do this by advisory boards, the community workers that can become a part of, we can include them as part of the research team. And it's also important, a part that's not talked about much is dissemination. When we find and we get the results from these studies, we should get that beyond clinicals or scientific journals, we should get that information out back to the community. Not everyone, have, most people don't have access to the scientific journals. And if we do this, not only do the community feel, get a better understanding or feedback of what the engagement is doing or what the research is doing, it encourages that continued partnership. So a study by, um, that was uh, by, run by Handy et al. regarding just an example with the community relationship building, they were trying to recruit black patients with breast cancer into a clinical trial. So they built relationships, which um, one thing, uh, uh, one thing our president says, uh, president at MSK, they'll say recently is that Dr. Wynn, that Dr. Uh, Vickers, is that building these relationships is not something that happens overnight. This is an investment. This is some, an investment that goes on for years and decades. And in this study, it was something similar they did. So obviously involving the community with the trial material design, but also outside of the trial, when certain events happened, the PI was reaching out to the community via letters. And this wasn't just about, I want you on my trial, but I really do care about the community. Targeted social marketing. So when we have social marketing that's targeted as they did in this study, they combined all this and did see that there was a 66% increase in the, um, the uh, 66 percent of the eligible, eligible patients were recruited into the trial. Uh, Another thing is, um, and this is uh, when I thought of Dr. Wynn. So I am, uh, I am an awardee of this, um, this, this program and I definitely uh, appreciate it and think very, very highly of it. We think that community engagement is innate. And I use the example that someone would just say, well, 
me, I can just look at myself and say, well, I'm a black guy. I can just walk into Harlem or Bronx in New York and talk to people and then I'll engage them or recruit them. But it doesn't work like that. We have to learn how to engage with the community. It's not innate, it has to be taught and learned. But beyond that, it has to be cultured, it has to be cultivated and it has to be updated as needed. One of the reasons why I highlight this is that the benefit, one of the benefits of diversity in clinical trials is that it improves the healthcare for everybody. So remember when I did show you the, uh, the proposed criteria that was recommended when they improved the inclusion of black uh, pancreatic cancer patients in trials, it also did the same for non-Hispanic whites. So improving diversity in clinical trials helps all of us, helps the population. Now improving access to clinical trials. So this does require uh, institutional commitment to access. So, uh, and this can occur in several ways. There are a couple of ways that I'll just touch on here briefly. This was actually a study by Anwuri et al, whereby they, in an NCI designated center, they changed, they attempted to change the system to see if will this increase uh, our enrollments of racial and ethnic minority population to our clinical trials. This required leadership support, infrastructural change processing, it was center-wide, and they were put in place means by which they actually analyzed the data and reported it. Essentially, if a study was at risk of, a study was at risk of closure if it was not meeting its goals, or didn't, and would have to come up with a plan on how to adjust it and meet the goals. They noticed a 60% increase in and clinical trial enrollment of their uh, racial and ethnic minority population. There was an overall increase in this patient, in the patient population in the uh, coming to the center as a whole. So it helps with the health, with general health care, cancer care, but also with clinical trial recruitment. And the other things to be mindful of are ways that we can actually whether it's by satellites or by collaborations, establishing a presence in these communities. And our community health centers are where most people get their care from. So not from the tertiary academic centers. So how those are involved with, or whether it's by collaboration or their or native trials there, how they're involved with uh, improving, they play a big role in improving um, clinical trial access for a racial and ethnic minority population. A um, couple of quick, um, quick uh, examples of three studies that looked at the role navigators can play. So rather than being, if you, in addition to being physically within these communities, you can use patient navigators to promote, uh, to assist with it. So culturally competent navigators in an American Indian population did show that increased the trial population to 22%. So historically, this is less than 1%. And these were just lay people that were taught in a culturally competent manner. Using an oncology nurse increased black patient participation over the course of two years to from 3% to 7%, with a 50, 51 out of 59 patients who are eligible being enrolled in these trials. And racially concordant patient navigators were also shown to be helpful. So there are different types of uh, navigators that we can utilize to improve enrollment and engagement with the oncology uh, patients. Uh, so Quick points in the summary, make eligibility criteria more inclusive, partner, engage in the community, and um, make sure that you improve access to clinical trials. And a big part of all this is prioritization. So budgeting appropriately for clinical trials. Uh, one last thing is, one, there's always talk about the cost of these things. The where you put your money does um, dictate or just does show what your priorities are. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pelagon. Um, the next talk will be by Dr. Conwell, and the title of his talk is Prevention of Pancreatic Diseases, NPF's Black African American Initiative. Good morning. Great, so I want to thank everyone for um, allowing me to speak today. It's exciting. Uh, uh, it is, it is um, a little bit sad that Pancreas Fest is now moving from Pittsburgh. We've been here for so long, you know, 
Um, but I guess it's good that um, others are getting more uh, involved. But thank you for allowing me just to talk about the NPF uh, Black African American uh, Initiative. Um, there's going to be more about um, engagement um, and um, and uh, education and empowerment we'll be talking about with my uh, presentation. So we'll briefly mention social determinants of health. You've heard uh, a lot about this. We'll talk about the initiative and we will talk about closing the disparity in pancreas cancer outcomes in the black and African-American community and also pancreatitis. And then I wanna just um, do a brief um, uh, thank you. African-Americans have the highest incidence rate of pancreas cancer in the United States. And you've heard uh, the data from our prior um, uh, speakers. And I think this is really something that we need to be, just be aware of and how we need to uh, address this. In the black community, it's well known that uh, there are very famous people, including uh, John Lewis and Dizzy Gillespie and Aretha Franklin who died of uh, pancreas cancer. So black people know this and they know about the problem, but they are scared to get enrolled in trials. They don't trust the system. And you heard uh, some of the brief uh, comments about prior history and some of the terrible things that have been done in the past and some of the egregious things that are currently um, happening now. I mean, I don't want, I can't um, tell you what it is like to be black in America. And for a recent quote to be said that black people benefited from slavery, which is a quote that was yesterday in the national media. It's just staggering that people in leadership think this way. And so it is hard to be black in the United States. We live in a very difficult uh, time. And so there's a lot of problems that we have that are related to just being black. And this that's just it. Your, your pigmentation is different. It's just different. So um, what I do want to um, spend a lot of time on is that the uh, NPF, I'm really proud to be um, a part of what they are doing. And I think the NPF is really great at establishing partnerships. And so we have the Precision Medicine Coalition, Black Health Matters, the John Robert Lewis Legacy Institute, the National Minority Health Association, Congressional Black Caucus. They are really good at reaching out and establishing um, uh, partnerships. And this uh, initiative is going across uh, the country. Future events will be in New York, Atlanta, Lexington, Kentucky, and the Bay Area. And I want you to be a part of that change. I want you to join us in this effort to try to stem the tide and reverse some of the things that we are seeing uh, in our communities. So social determinants of health, we talked a lot about that. We all know a lot about it, um, really came to the forefront during the um, COVID pandemic when we asked people to distance themselves. Then in the inner city, you can't distance yourself. There's a lot more people uh, in your dwelling. You can't spread out. And so COVID just really ripped through a lot of the inner cities and some of the communities that are suffering. But the outcomes in our, in our, in our, in our health system, a lot of it is related to uh, where you eat, where you play, where you live, where you worship, um, it, it affects your outcome. Up to 80% of the outcomes are affected uh, by that. So one of the things I want you to think about is I want you to be the change that you wish to see in the world. And I want you to think about how do you want the world to look? What do you want your children and your grandchildren uh, to see? What do you want them to experience? We don't want to have some of the, you know, the Henrietta Lacks, the syphilis type uh, experiments. We don't want those things repeated. And we want people treated equally just based on the content of their character and not the color of their skin. So think about what you want to do. So three things I want to challenge you with. One is engagement. And you've heard about this. And so my, con my, my lecture to you is going to be about boots on the ground, getting involved, so how do we engage? So this is just one example of what we're doing in Lexington. This is my wife and I at a diabetes uh, community health and wellness event. And we've got NPF literature. We're there handing it out. It costs nothing to set up a table. Uh, the NPF will send you all of the literature. They'll send you a tablecloth um, that we now have that says, has the NPF on it and all the literature to educate um, patients, to educate the community uh, about uh, pancreatic disease, pancreatitis and pancreas uh, cancer. Health system, we have to get our health systems involved because there are problems with access to care. All of our, uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of clinics in the inner city. If you don't pressure your leadership to say, listen, we have transportation issues, there's financial toxicity issues, and we have to have a clinic in the community and go to where the patients uh, patients are. So that's, that's very, very important. The, the second component is education. 
how do we go about educating uh, the community? This is um, the DigiReach download from the NPF. This has been vetted. They, they have had thousands of um, views of this. This goes through acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, pancreas cancer at a level that people can understand. It's, it's, it's not for physicians, it's for people in the lay community to understand uh, pancreatic uh, disease. It's very, very well written. It's been vetted by a lot of people. I was, I was, I was uh, honored to be part of that committee along with uh, Jamal and Dana Anderson uh, and, and others. But this is the type of information we need to get to churches and the community centers and schools and to festivals uh, and, and, and health fairs. Education looks like this. So what does that table look like? It's full of literature to give patients, to sit and engage them, talk to them. Do you need to do this? How can we help you with your diabetes? How can we help you with your hypertension? We talk to them. Here's what you need to eat. Here's what you need. Here's where you need to shop. How do you shop in a grocery store? Do you go to the periphery of the grocery store or do you go down the aisles where all the canned goods are and the high salt, um, high salt products are? So these are things that we have to help uh, people understand. So I wanna talk about a couple of things that switches us from the engagement and education, and it was mentioned empowerment. How do we empower our population? A couple of things, health equity and education. I wanna talk about that. And so we have started to have webinars. This is our first webinar that we had. It was a personalized medicine and experience. I was honored to, uh, to host this for the NPF, but also Stanford was there. The John R. Robert Lewis uh, Foundation was there. So was Morehouse College of Medicine. And it was a wonderful time to talk about um, pancreatic disease and start getting the word out about what we need to do, identifying the problem and educating people and trying to let them know what you need to do uh, to, go, to go forward. The second uh, webinar uh, that we had was about patient resources for pancreas disease after diagnosis. What do you do now that you have pancreatitis? What do you do now that you have pancreas cancer? And we had a very robust uh, discussion. We had partnerships with the Congressional Black Caucus, and we had partnerships with the National Minority uh, Health Association. If you go to the Congressional Black Caucus's website, you will see the following, securing our democracy, protecting our freedoms, and uplifting our culture. If you go to the National Minority Health Association, you will see the following quote from Nelson Mandela, health cannot be a question of income, it is a fundamental human right. And I think most of us here um, believe that. Also, it's important that we put people in the community that look like the people in that community. And Jamal talked about this earlier. So nurses, physicians, uh, healthcare workers, um, navigators, um, uh, nurse practitioners, advanced practice providers, it, there's, there's some identity there. You're speaking the same language, same culture. You understand it's so important. This is a group called the Association of Black Gastroenterologists and Hepatologists. Three of these people were some of my mentees. It's really amazing. It's really, I'm really proud of them. Um, but they are engaging the community. They're going around the country and saying, we are here for you. We're here to help you. We understand the pain, the struggles, and we are here to help. And it makes a big difference, um, makes a huge difference. But we just can't do that. We have to go back to our school systems. We have to go to our grade schools. We have to go back and stem the tide. COVID has really ripped through the educational system. Whether you're black, white, doesn't matter. If you had COVID really damaged our educational uh, system. My wife and I this summer did a math camp and she's the math teacher, not me. I'm just there kind of like the, the security or whatever, you know, kind of keeping these, keeping these boys in their seats. But, but we've got to, I want to challenge you to get engaged be a part of the solution, close the gap. And so we're in the inner city because you know, th these are our people. These are our children. They look like us. They look like our grandchildren. And so we are there teaching these boys algebra. And so they can have a, have a, have a, a good experience when they start um, classes uh, in the fall, but get involved in your community and, and participate. Now, the, the tragedy is there are less black male physicians now in the United States than there was in the 1970s. That's a tragedy. That is, that, is, that is a tragedy. It makes no sense at all. And it's very complicated. And it's, it's not really pointing the finger at anybody. It's just the way it is. 
So let's just be part of the change. So this is something at a college of medicine at Kentucky student called Black Men in Medicine. And we, um, once a month, introduce them to the musculoskeletal system, or the pulmonary uh, system, digestive system, and we bring in a physician. We take them to the nurse's uh, simulation area and they learn about EKGs and they learn about uh, uh, doing CPR. Um, we also take them to the food connection that teaches them how to eat healthy foods, how to make healthy choices. They prepare the food uh, so they know how um, to uh, make the right choices and how to prepare that. And this is the, the white coat um, ceremony that we had here we graduated them and say, you know, you, you finished this and one day you can be a, a healthcare provider. You can be a nurse, you can be a doctor, you can be an APP, uh, you can be a physician uh, assistant. So this is some things that, that we are doing. Um, so empowerment is also this. How do we teach someone that, you know, your alcohol use was too much. You're smoking. You need to stop doing that. You need to decrease that. That is contributing to your pancreatitis. That's contributing uh, to your uh, disability you're overweight, we've got to make better food choices, you've got diabetes, what do we what do, we do uh, about that? So the NPF has uh, a beautiful, um, uh, beautiful uh, recipe book uh, to use for healthy food choices. And you can download this for free from the uh, website. So it's a very comprehensive uh, program that the NPF has come up with to really help and engage uh, our population to educate them and also to empower them. So one of the things that um, also that we did was the MPF went to Congress and this was a lot of fun. You can go to your Congress and schedule a meeting with your House of Representatives or your Senator and tell them what's important to you. So there was advocacy. We wanted more research dollars to the NIH and we talked about some other, uh, other uh, issues. But one of the things that was mentioned today is very important, and it's all well and good to go to the community. It's all well and good to, um, to engage them and to educate them. Um, but we need to um, empower them, but we also need to work with them. So it was mentioned, so, so community uh, engaged research, what do they need? What do they want? And so this is a study that was done in Columbus. Uh, this community-based intervention impacts um, black males. And I'll briefly show this, it's called the Black Impact uh, Pilot uh, Study. So there's a, there's a, a Life Simple 7, which is now um, Life's Essential 8, you know, Stop smoking, eat better, get active, lose weight, and changing and altering these the right direction. If you get four out of these seven right, you have a 75% lower diabetes incidence. If you get five out of these right, it cuts your cardiovascular disease by 50% and on and on. So healthy nutrition, lifestyle, performance, um, lowering your cholesterol and doing the right thing can really impact um, impact your health. So this Black Impact study really stemmed from the African-American Male Wellness Walk in Columbus. And what they do every year is there's a huge um, health screening uh, registration, like up to two to 3,000 Black men register and get screened. And this is a um, one of the screening tables. This is actually my wife, Kathy, there doing uh, finger sticks for, uh, for blood uh, glucose. But there are uh, nurses, healthcare providers getting screened. You have a sheet and you're just checking off. What do you weigh? You know, what's your cholesterol? What's your blood pressure? Do you have diabetes? And by the time you get to the end, if you've talked to nurses and healthcare workers, there's a whole row of physicians. And they, we go over your sheet and tell you what you need to do. And if you don't have a primary care doctor, we give you a list of primary care physicians, not just for when I was at Ohio State, it's for any of the any of the health system. But here, here's the list. Uh, who's close to you? So go. Here's where you can go and get this taken uh, taken care of. So um, and they also they have a walk. Um, you know, a 3K, 5K uh, walk. So it's all about getting healthy and healthy. So this that's that's what um, uh, spurred uh, this 100. Um, black male uh, study. And so we, they got, what they did was they had a hundred black men in Columbus, Ohio. They got them health coaches, exercise, uh, counseling, education. They met in the parks um, in the, on the basketball uh, courts and did exercises and calisthenics there. And the goal was to lose some weight, get 150 minutes of physical activity uh, per week. And there were partnerships, again, with the African-American Mill Wellness Walk Initiative, with the City of Columbus Parks and Recreations. They gave them free passes to go to the parks. There were smoking cessation, stress management. They donated blood pressure cuffs to, uh, to these men to really try to make uh, a difference. 
And the reason they did this because nationally, black men had the lowest levels of life simple seven and the low level is not good. You want a higher level to decrease uh, your chances of having uh, problems. So this was a community-based team lifestyle change program to try to impact that score, your life simple seven uh, score. So they assessed them at 12 weeks and assessed them again at 24 weeks. And what did they find? The punchline is they increased the score by 0.67 at 12 weeks and 0.93 at 24 weeks. And you say, wow, that's, what's, what's the big deal? When I read that, I said, well, that, what, what's, what's up with that? Well, hold on. That's almost one point improvement in your Life Simple 7 uh, score. And what they found is that a one point higher cardiovascular score is associated with an 18% and 19% lowering of the odds of stroke and myocardial infarction, just one point, respectively, and that 11% and 19% lower risk of all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. So they wanna do more trials. And so one of the things I will, I will, I will tell you and, and to wrap up is, so social determinants of health are important and we have to really try to impact and minimize their, uh, their, their, their impact on health outcomes. But the MPF has, has launched this initiative and we're very excited about it with community partnerships, advancing health equity, there's congressional advocacy. A lot of uh, U.S. congressmen have joined into this. Um, uh, Jane Holt and the team, um, so Paul and the team, they've all submitted a CDC grant to try to get some funding for this to get a dedicated staff person to help keep this initiative alive and going. How are we going to close the gap? Engagement, education, empowerment, and addressing these modifiable risk factors, you know, the smoking, the alcohol, the obesity, the diabetes. The future webinar, webinar number three, will, will, will feature the two researchers, Daryl Gray and Joshua Joseph, who were at Ohio State at the time, and their Black Impact 100. We're going to have them on our webinar to talk about, and we can learn and try to spread this across uh, the country, that you can do community-engaged research um, with, uh, with people right there in your neighborhood. So that is the end of my talk. And I want Dave just to come up briefly, if you can, Dave. I have nothing to give you but a, but a hug, you know? I got no, I got no trophy, but I, I just wanna just say this, um, on behalf of um, all of us, Thank you. Thank you. The, um, the, um, the PRSS1 gene mutation was discovered in um, Eastern Kentucky somewhere, right? right? But pancreas fest, caper, CPDPC, T1DAPC, Inspire, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the things that we are doing now, um, thanks to Jose, Dana, Einer, listening to us finally in pancreatic disease, and we're here now. And the young people that are in this room, you've got a golden opportunity to collaborate and work together like you see us all doing here. You will not be successful doing pancreatic disease by yourself. You've got to come together. And I remember Jose saying this a long time ago. You guys were beating each other up, but we've come together. And that's what makes Pancreas Fest so nice. And I just want everyone just to remember this. So the last thing I'm going to say, and this is more personal, and um, I just can't thank you enough for what you've done in my career. Um, but I want to leave you with uh, some, parting, some parting words. And this is a, Dave and I share the same faith. And this is a quote from the Bible. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Thank you for your servant leadership. My and amen. amen. Thank you, Dr. Conwell. Uh, we'll open this up for discussion, questions. We'll have a, at least three questions. Um, but yeah, I think that Dr. Conwell resonated that perfectly. What has been presented by these three uh, panelists today has really done a tremendous job to, to really consider UMP grants, because if you look at what uh, was mentioned uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Zisi and then Dr. Bulagon, um, to think about the pancreatitis, pancreatic cancer kind of kind of realm and and the 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 tissues that could be available, 
please. Hi, Steve Pando from Los Angeles. Uh, first of all, great, great seminar. Uh, and I, um, we don't want to be politically usually at these kinds of meetings, but Darwin gave us an opening. And uh, so Darwin, you're, um, you're uh, alluding to a statement that the governor, uh, our famous governor from Florida, leaves us an opening. And it seems to me like what, what you presented in terms of health care for um, uh, disadvantaged minorities, uh, actually, if we don't address that, we're, we're weaker as a nation for a variety of different reasons. And I wonder if what your organization, our NPF and other healthcare organizations here can do together is educate, educate our politicians. They, they need to have an understanding that their rhetoric and ultimately their work has to improve the health of our nation. I think that's a primary consideration. And I'm just wondering if there's a strategy you can think about there. And you can bring in the American Diabetes Association, right. Cancer Association, all these kind of things. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. And yeah, I don't know, is Jane Holt here? Is Jane here? She had to leave. Yeah, I mean, we went to Congress with that message. And you know, we were there, there was an educational briefing uh, that we held on. That was the message that we conveyed. We actually rounded and went to different um, uh, senators' uh, offices and talked to their staffers about uh, the needs uh, in the Black and African American uh, community, but also all underrepresented minorities, and also talked about just funding for research in general for that we need for all of our research. But that is the way that we're going to do this. We're going to, have to educate people um, in, in a in a non confrontational, non political way. I mean, I, I said to the congressman, I said, "Cancer does not care what color your skin is." It could care less, and he, he knows that. And you, you got it, you got it. It's not differentiating, um, and so I think we have to really uh, work hard to educate people and try to come to a table. I, I really want to sit down with people on the extremes of our political system and just listen. I want to. I, I don't want to fight. I want to listen to them. Why do you think this way? Let me better understand your position, and where can we find some mutual ground to do the right thing. And not get angry, but let's talk about what we really need to do to improve our healthcare as a nation. Because we got huge problems that get uncovered when we have COVID or we have a tornado or a hurricane. And there are certain populations that just they're stuck, that they just can't get out of it. And it just exacerbates their conditions. So I have, I have a question for Dr. ZC and also to follow with Dr. Balagon. Um, considering the fact that Dr. ZC, you have just a tremendous wealth of pancreatitis patients at the University of North Chicago. And, you know, Dr. Balagon mentioned a lot about the the you know, the pan pancreatic cancer and its 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 role in black patients affected more than 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 whites. Um, is there any consideration for the idea that the people that you're seeing, the population you're seeing at the University of North Chicago, are they having a higher trend toward pancreatic cancer, given that 80%, you said, or at least higher, a very high percentage uh, had pancreatitis? Have you looked at that uh, at the University of Illinois? I, I did not specifically uh, look into pancreatic cancer, but we have um, a designated cancer center, Dr. Bogum mentioned in their center. So um, they're working on it. I mean, I'm working on that in regards to pancreatitis aspect, but we also have oncologists which really high interest in, in health inequities and in, in, in pancreatic cancer. So they are also having community engagement boards and and grassroots activities as, as Dr. Connell mentioned. And I think they are putting a really large P50 grant together in our uh, Institute of Minor, Minority Health to address the structural uh, violence and social determinants health across the globe, and that includes pancreatic cancer as well. Dr. Balagan, any comment? So I think um, we we know that pancreatitis is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer, and uh, we can, while it may not have been looked at within the UIC population. The I can expect that if we look at the incidence of pancreatic cancer there, it's higher. Um, there's definitely a predominant or a higher population of Black uh, people who live there, but also with the increased rates of pancreatitis we're seeing, I'd expect it to be higher. Question? Uh, excellent uh, session. Uh, just to get back to the clinical trial question, this is something uh, I really would appreciate your opinion. I always have a hard time. What should be the target 
for recruitment? Should it be your local area here? Should we be enriching minorities in our session? How can I feel if I'm actually doing a good job in enrolling what you know for the target population as a percentage in your in a trial? I mean, I can take the question first. I think um, probably, I think in any clinical trial, we want to have a good representation of, of the entire population. If we have 50, you know, 40 to 45 percent minorities and we only include 10 percent of them in our clinical trial, I think that's not probably a good representation. So I think the, the target should be at least there in that range. And I think uh, what help us at least in our Type 1, the APC study, is, as I mentioned, that, that some of the centers that were really selected were serving really, um, you know, communities that are really enriching underrepresented minorities. And I think that's probably, a, a, you know, another place to, to start and try to enrich these centers that really service the minority communities. Yeah, I, I would, I, I can um, comment on that. I mean, I think what we want, you know, these are usually NIH trials, right? I think the target is our population demographics, right? What percent of our population is Hispanic? What percent of our population, that's the target. What percent are female? And um, when you're building these consortiums, I know that's the thing I think about is, and that's what we're looking at in our, our recruitment and retention committee. That's our target. Are we representing the country in this study? Because the, the, because the data and the results, we want to apply to the entire health of the nation, right? Just, you know, these are NIH trials. All right, well, due to time, we're, we'll break for lunch. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, you know, any questions?